Hey, good evening, everyone. I'm super delighted, actually, um, to host this edition of my uh, free webinars, which I have once in a while. And um, today we're looking at school policies and procedures. By the way, my name is Nancy Kaizu, and I do this once in a while. It's my way of giving back to society. Whenever I notice the topic that is posing a problem or is becoming a challenge to a lot of people, we yeah, are just step in and see how I can help with sharing information and knowledge. And I do this regularly on my various platforms. Or once in a while, I actually um, organize a webinar. So you're welcome this evening. We are 34 already. We are 34, and that's a good number to start. And I can see a lot of people are still joining. So thank you so much for honoring my invitation to be here. I'm going to go on right away to share the slides, but I'll tell you why I did. I decided to have this webinar. Uh, a lot of people have been struggling with structure, um, struggling with having um, um, job descriptions, with having performance management, with um, having policies and procedures, which makes them um, for not very um, regular and normal uh, smooth operations in the school. So today we are focusing on school policies and procedures. And we're going to look at several aspects of this. We'll look at what school policies are, um, what kind of policies you need to have in a school, and then um, the steps that you need to take in order to create policies. And please wait till the end because I have various announcements I'll be making. And so I'm beginning to share my slide right, 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 right now. Okay. So I'm sharing my slides right away. I hope you can see the slide. If you can see the slide, please say yes in the comments. You can see the slide, Nancy. Okay, that's beautiful. I'm trying to see where I can um, share this as so that it would be uh, better. Where do I, uh oh, this is blocking something. Okay, I wanted to see where to share the reading, the slide view. Just share it as a slide so that it will be broader. Okay, so we're starting, we're starting, we're starting, okay? So the topic is creating school policies and procedures. Creating school policies and procedures. And this is the course outline. I'm going to introduce all about it. Then we'll look at what policies are, what procedures are, why are policies important in schools, then what are the policies we need to have, and what are important steps that you need to take to create policies and who exactly is in charge of policies in a school, okay? All right, so I like to introduce myself in every session that I take because I do not take it for granted. Some people may never have met me and this is their first encounter with me. So I'm your facilitator today and the convener of this training. I'm Nancy Ekpaizu, I'm very Googleable. I like to say that a lot, if you check, Google, if you just Google Nancy Ekwezu and my expressions and the various things I do pop up, but I'm a chartered administrator, a chartered manager and a life coach. I'm an education and management consultant and the founder of Pezu Smith Consulting. I'm also the founder of the Facebook group Educational Administration Network with about 15,000 followers from various countries around the world. And in recent years, in the past few years, I've carved a niche for myself as a renowned educational administration expert. I've been a school administrator in four reputable schools in four cities in Nigeria, leading to their development. And on my last job, I led a team of over about 150 employees in a group of schools managed by a reputable multinational in Lagos. I'm the author of three books, um, Dear Educator, which was published in 2019, The School Administrator's Companion, which was published in 2021, and my latest book, Effective Boarding House Administration, which was published in December 2021. I'm a trainer, I'm a mentor, I'm a coach. I'm also a TEDx speaker. 
and I am the founder of the Connected School Administrators Academy, which is the arm of my expression that trains school administrators, school managers, and school owners, and also to prepare teachers who are preparing for management and leadership roles in schools. It kicked off in January 2021 and 2022, and the current cohort, cohort one, will be ending in March, and the next cohort will be starting in April next month. So that is it about me. You can find out the rest about me from my from social media. I just Google Nancy Epezu and you'll see a whole lot of things will come up about me. So I need us to imagine now, just, oh, we have 44 of us now, 45. Oh, that's great. And so people are waiting. Please allow them in. There are five people waiting. Okay, so um, I need us to imagine your school without any policies, without any procedures. Just imagine, just picture it. Can you picture your school without any policies or any um, procedures? You know, some people come in and they just do their thing the way they want to do it. And they'll tell you, well, that's how we've always done it, where we are coming from. Why are you bothering us? Just imagine that kind of setting in your school. I'm sure you know that it would be chaotic to say the least, okay? Imagine that someone comes in shorts, another one comes in a Iro and Buba, uh, okay, to tie wrappers, another one comes in daily to your school. One comes believing that children must be beaten blue and black before they learn. Another one comes believing that there are disciplinary measures you can put in place without necessarily beating children. Just imagine all of that in your school, okay? Example, exactly. Someone says there'll be utter chaos. Yes, I totally agree with you, Charlotte Okorua. There will be utter chaos if that happens, okay? So imagine that you come in, some people believe children should be beaten with a cane. Another one says, no, you must smack them with your hand. Other ones say, no, 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 and where I'm coming from, in fact, we lock them up in a room with no light and we leave them there. Others say, no, deny them break time. Others say, no, there are other ways, you know? So that's what happens in schools where there are no policies or procedures. Everybody does their thing. Is a free show for everybody. There's chaos, okay? So we're going to look at what policies are. I'm not a very big fan of big definitions and uh, going on and on about definitions. I like rather to have hands-on application of any concept or anything that I'm involved with and to also share uh, my experience, okay? So what are policies? Basically, we would say that policies are essentially the governing documents or rules by which your school is operated. In other words, when you come to your school, they should know what governs your school, what you believe in, what you stand for, the things you allow and the things you do not allow. And this is not different from other organizations. So I do not understand why some people set up schools and decide that there is no point having rules or that um, they don't want to bother the teachers or that the teachers even say they don't want to be bothered by school owners and they just want to do their thing. So policies are the governing documents or rules by which your school is operated. I need you to look at that. Governing documents or rules by which your school is operated. A policy is a set of rules and regulations for accomplishing a task. In other words, for your organization to accomplish the tax for which it was sent, the objectives for which it was sent, you must have policies that guide everybody. They are the ones that actually serve as a guideline that directs people to where you're heading to, the things you will allow, the things you will not allow, and all of that. Our procedures are step-by-step -step way of doing things. I'm going to give an example. You can have a policy that says, um, your policy is that every child must have undergo the admission before getting into your school. But the procedure will now say step by step what they do to get that admission. In other words, no parent just comes in and pays and gets uh, into your school. The parent, the child, the, the child, every child must, must pass through admission, the admission process. So the procedure will now tell what that will now help you accomplish that policy. Remember the policy is no child is admitted, admitted into XYZ school unless a test has been conducted. That is a policy, okay? No child is admitted into, let's say Nancy Pezu group of schools 
until uh, until a test has been uh, has been has been carried out to ascertain the right class or level for him or her. That is a policy. Now, what is the procedure? The procedure would be visit our website, download the form, um, pay for the admission form. All of these details are there on the website too. After that, bring the child for admission test. We release the results. There is a, based on that, we place your child in a class and then you pay. So that those are the steps I have outlined now are the procedures. That's the procedure for getting that policy done. Remember, the policy is no child is allowed, is, um, is, is, um, uh, no child is admitted into this school unless they undergo the admission process. That is a policy. The procedure is what I've just said buy the form, do this, do that. So it gives you step-by-step -step way of doing things. In other words, the procedures help you to accomplish the policy. That's the step-by-step -step way of doing the policy, of carrying out that policy. So a procedure articulates the details of how to accomplish a task or a policy. A procedure articulates the details on how to accomplish a task or a policy. Now, why do we need policies in schools? I need you to just say your opinion in the comments, right in the chat. Why do you think we need policies in schools? Why do we need policies? Because we have to establish rules and regulations to guide acceptable behavior. It has right, to establish rules and regulations to guide acceptable behavior. Please unmute every, uh, mute everybody, please. I can hear some people talking. We are 52 now, and if everybody starts talking, then there'll be a problem, okay? Someone, Yusuf says we have policies to avoid chaos. That is true. But basically what they help to do is to establish rules and regulations to guide acceptable behavior. Policies ensure that the school environment is safe and secure for students, teachers, and other staff. Imagine that there are no rules about safety or anything. Someone comes to the school, just begins to fight another teacher, and no self-control, nothing. Okay, policies guide our operations. Very good. So, um, I think Kumi says, policies guide our operations. Oluwa Tosi says, um, to guide and direct for acceptable code of conduct. Very good. These are all correct. So you can see that without policies, there'll be a big problem. Without rules, without regulations. Okay, so policies ensure that the school environment is safe and secure for students, teachers, and other staff. We need policies, policies to guide and establish standards. Policies offer guidelines of how the management and stakeholders believe their school should be run. So if you're coming from another school, you don't say, no, this is how we were doing it there, I must continue like that. It gives you a guideline of how this particular school should be run, how we do things in this particular school. Policies establish standards in a school for quality of learning. Policies help students, teachers, and other staff and parents to be accountable. Policies inform the employees of the organization's vision and purpose and the steps to incorporate that in their everyday duties and tasks. Policies ensure efficiency and continuity on job roles. Policies are vital for the efficiency, morale, and overall productivity of any organization. Policies save valuable time in decision-making and actions as they provide a guideline. Policies allow for uniformity of decision-making by staff members. Now imagine that we need to take a decision about something and everybody just brings their own opinion. At the end of the day, it's really the policy of the school that will decide. Let's say someone, for example, floods a student and you know that that is a no-no in your school. It is the policies of the organization that will decide, not the sentiments, not how the manager feels about that person, not if they not whether that person is related to the school administrator or the head of school or the school owner. Okay, it is also a legal requirement for schools to create several policies, such as anti-bullying policies, attendance policies, and several other ones, which we are going to look at. Policies support staff in their management of situations, which may involve violent or threatening behavior. Without policies, schools will lack the structure 
and function which is necessary to provide the educational needs of the students. Now, policies also protect the organization from being taken advantage of. Imagine that there are no procurement policies in a school. You can just wake up and say, oh, we need them. We need them um, 60 uh, markers for my class. Another one will say we need 100. If there's no policy, no procedure, how these things are got, then everybody will just be doing their own thing. And they can easily take advantage of the organization. It also protects the employees from being taken advantage of. Imagine your employer or the head of school or school administrator wakes up one morning, comes to school angry and doesn't like your face and decides that they want to sack you for no reason. Because they're right, there's a let down procedure. There's, there are policies that guard how people are even um, dismissed from the organization. The person is restrained from doing that and being ruled by his or her emotions because there are policies that clearly state what will happen before somebody is laid off and even how the person is laid off, the procedure for laying the person off. So it protects the employees from being taken advantage of and also protects the organization from being taken advantage of. Policies empower the employees with knowledge and a sense of belonging and pride about the organization because they are involved with it. Oh, we are 51 now. Because they are involved with it, there's a sense of pride, a sense of belonging that comes with it. It also makes delegation easier. When there are laid down policies and procedures, it makes delegation a lot easier. Because if I'm, if, you're, if I'm delegating to someone, let's say I'm the school administrator and I'm traveling and maybe the head of school has to stand in for me or the head teacher, the person knows how things are done in the organization already. There's already there are already policies, there are already procedures for how things are done. So they would not be taking decisions contrary to what I would if I were in that position. But if there are no policies, the person would have to start from scratch and be racking their head over everything that happens. So it makes delegation easier. You can delegate and go to sleep and the work is going on. And that's the difference between a school that has policies and the ones that do not have policies. Because the one that has policies, the school owner can actually travel for a while. And because they structure their policies, their procedures, they, they, everybody there is expected to follow them. And when they don't follow, you would know. Okay. Okay, so that is it about why we should have policies. I've looked at the comments that you have made. And yes, those are all um, standard reasons why we should have policies. I'm actually trying to go through this because I'm more particular about the process, the steps for making them, okay? What are the policies a school must have? First of all, you line, write in the comment what policies you have in your own school. I'll be reading them out. Let's see, the, I will not call your name, but I'll just read the policies. So what are the policies a school must have? Now, every school must have some, there are some policies that are a must for every school. And then there are some that you need to put together for your own peculiar school or unique school. Okay? Someone says school fees policy, very important too, because money is, is, is a very major thing in schools. Safeguarding and child protection policy, absolutely. Okay? Very important. Recruitment policy, handwriting policy, amazing. Yes, handwriting policy in some schools, not all, some schools have that, where they say that once a child gets to, let's say, year four, they start writing cursive, health and safety policy, these are all sports policy, very important, sports policy. So keep them coming, keep them coming. Behavior and management policy, very important. Thank you so much. Behavior and management policy, anti-bullying policy, amazing. Thank you so much. So we're going to have a look at the policies that a school must have. We are 53 now, and I think the numbers are still growing. Some people like coming late to things. Child protection policy, that is a must. So there are some broad policies every school must have, such as safeguarding and welfare of children policies, health and safety policies. You cannot run a school without health and safety policies. Whether it is a primary school, a non a, a LES, so marking policy, very important, grading policy, marking, how to mark. 
So safeguarding and welfare of children policies, health and safety policies, school finance policies, which will cover a lot, okay, a lot about finance, general school policies, parent school policies, curriculum policies, school improvement policies, admissions and enrollment policies. All these are policies that uh, admission, someone has mentioned that. All these are policies that every school must have. Every school must have those ones. So let's look at safeguarding policies now. You know, safeguarding is quite broad. So under safeguarding, you must have anti-bullying policy. You must have confidential confidentiality policy. So if there are issues of, let's say, child abuse or whatever, you must have policies that, that guard the confidentiality of whoever is involved. You must have incidents policy. If a child falls down, uh, maybe has an injury, has a bruise, what do you do? What is the step? Do you have an incident report? Is it reported and documented? You must have the sick child policy. Very important so that you protect others from, from, the, from that. Even communicable disease policy, which we're going to look at in the health policy. Supervision of students policy. By now, I'm sure we all know that it's a policy that no child is left unsupervised in any school at all. So there must be a roster for supervision and the procedure for how it is done, okay? So supervision of students' policy, very important. School trips policy, when they go out, what, what are the policies for them to go out on school trips? You must have human resources policies, staff and employment policy, recruitment policies, equal opportunities policies, which will say that all of all, um, uh, all positions in the school are open to both males and females, irrespective of their gender, religion, um, age, or whatever. Okay, so equal opportunities policy. Okay. Health and safety policy, very important, even for the staff. It's not only for children, even for the staff, you must have health and safety policies uh, that bother around the staff. Equipment and resources policy, emergency action policy, all of this was actually be in the school. Then you have school staff policy, various policies, acceptable use of school laptops policy. Some schools do not allow you to bring your personal laptop to the school. So they make sure they provide a laptop for every staff member who needs to use a laptop. And they'll tell you, you cannot take it home. You must work right there in the office. So those are actually uh, policies that some schools have, that you cannot use your personal laptop for official work, okay? And that you cannot take the laptop home. And even for those that are allowed to take it home, during the, before they go for maybe mid-term break or end of term, they have to turn, turn in the, the laptops, okay? Alcohol and drug use policy. There's a policy in schools that school staff must not drink alcohol on campus. So even when you have events, even when you have events in the school, no alcohol is served. Also drug, nicotine, um, cocaine, heroin, um, all of those drug drugs, they are not allowed in a school setting. Career break policy, do you allow people to take a career break and still come back to your school? All of this must be clearly, clearly stated. Some schools do not allow that, while some schools do. Study leave policy. Do you have a study leave policy where people can take a study leave maybe for, uh, for a while and still come back to your school and will they are reabsorbed again? Do you have conflict of interest policy that says if you're employed in this school, you cannot take any other paid employment, okay? And you're also not allowed to appear in the media, uh, even media policy. You're not allowed to appear in the media um, to, to talk about the school without permission from the top management. I remember working in a place that had that kind of policy. And every school should have those kind of policies. Even um, internet policies, social media policies. Some people just take pictures of children and start showing all over um, social media without approval from the school. Every school must have policies that tell what to do in such cases. Okay, so you must have those. Okay, someone says, I can't hear you. Please, can you all hear me? Can you say whether you can hear me or not? If you can hear me, say yes. Yes, okay. yes, 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 you are good to go. Okay, thank you, please. Okay, thank you. I think that 
That must be from your own problem, actually. People are hearing me rather than clear. So you must have conflict of interest policy. Okay, if you are if you, if the policy should state something like every employee of this school shall not take, is not allowed to take any other paid employment that conflicts with the work hours. So if they want to do anything on weekends, that is their own, but so long and they cannot be employed in another school so long they are actually working here. So those are the kind of policies you want your school to have. Then continuing professional development policy. Some people have a policy that as long as you're in this organization, you must embark on continuing professional development. The evidence must be attended courses. Please mute the people who are talking. And if you join without audio, please get your audio on, but do not put it on. You should be, you should just be on to hear, but not to speak. So some, I remember working in a school where I had to create a policy that everybody must present the courses that they've attended in a school year based on areas that from the performance management where we said they needed to improve on. So you might have continuing professional development courses where people have to take a certain number of courses. It doesn't have to be paid courses. There are some that are free, um, such as what you have, um, maybe there's some online courses, Coursera, um, Udemy, so many. There are some of them offer free courses, and some are paid. Then dealing with allegations against other school personnel, you must have policies that guard, it, um, guard all these kind of things so that nobody um, takes advantage of another one or lies on someone else. You should also have disciplinary procedures. You should have a policy for induction of new staff, new staff. So induction of new staff policy. What do you take them through? What are the things they must know as they are joining your organization? All these must be policies. Some schools take everything for granted. They will just employ someone and say, oh, um, come and start. So I know you have worked in another school before. Come and start. Exactly. Someone said um, PSHE and sex education policy. Very important in the times we are in. Very important. Maternity leave policy. What is your policy about maternity leave? Some schools pay while the person is on maternity and some do not pay. Okay. Some would say you have to be a confirmed staff before you can enjoy maternity leave. Others will say you can just come in and, and have a baby, whatever they allow it. You expect time mothers and work policy. How long must somebody work in this organization before they can announce that they are pregnant and the school takes care of their, of their salary while they, are, um, while, they are, um, while they are on leave, okay? That's not relationships and work policy. Some schools discourage people from dating because they believe that it will distract them or bring um, bias in the organization or prejudice about others, or maybe they can connect to do some things. So even when people announce that they are getting married and they've been dating and they're working in the same place, they might say one of them will have to resign. So some schools do not like couples working there because they feel they'll be protecting each other's interest against that of the organization. School personnel code of conduct, you must have code of conduct for the staff. You must have, somebody say something. Please mute or Mm. Dress code, you must have staff dress code. Some schools allow people to wear Ankara, that's the local fabrics. Some say no, it has to be purely English, it has to be suit. I've worked in a school where we could wear jeans to work and look smart along with talking, and the jeans were not ripped or dirty or looking too rugged, but just straight and nice. I've also worked in a school where I had to wear suits almost every day. I've worked with semi casual or semi business. Um, uh, you know, was actually allowed, okay? So it all depends on what your school wants to portray. So you must have st a staff dressing. Some schools even go the extra mile of choosing the colors for the staff. I don't know about that, but that's what some schools even do. Some have even uniforms for their staff, whatever. So you must have also have staff absence and leave policy. Whistleblowing policy, how do you report people that are into malpractices? If someone, 
uh, collects money to buy things for the school and misappropriates the money or forges the amount that should be um, for the item, how do you report? So some schools have a whistleblowing policy. Some schools also have a work-life balance policy so that there's a limit on the number of hours that the staff spend in the school. And whatever it is, you must make sure you utilize the office hours and finish up your work so that you, can, you do not have to take work home on weekends, okay? They also limit the number of trainings they have um, uh, in, a, in, a, in a school year, uh, if it is going to hold on a Saturday, okay? Oh, wow, we're 61 now. People are still joining. Then you have health and safety policies, okay? Health and safety, fire safety policy, which of course also means um, you must know what to do when there's a fire. Such a school have policies that all the extinguishers must always be up to date and check, and that everybody understands fire drills, okay? Sick child policy, what do you do with a sick child? Is a sick child allowed in the school and for what? The child has, for example, communicable diseases such as moms, Pox, are all those poxes, chicken pox, small pox, measles, okay, there must be policies around all of those. When is the child allowed back in school? Is it when everything has cleared or when the doctor certifies the, the child fit to be in school? Then you have food handlers policy. Food handlers policy, food handlers policy. So some schools, the caterers must undergo the food handlers test before they are employed. And even while they are employed, they also make sure that they take that test regularly. Then you have risk assessment policy, where you make sure that the environment is always safe for the children. So you do several risk assessment and even risk assessment when they are going out on field trips to assess the area for security and for safety for a lot of things. Incidents policy, I think I mentioned that earlier. No smoking policy, okay? I mean, every school should have a no smoking policy because we do not want to raise children who take such habits from their teachers or other staff who work in the school. We should have school's toilet policy. How often should the toilets be cleaned? And this should actually, and then what happens? Everybody who uses it must flush. Everybody, so there are such policies. So if you're caught using a toilet and you do not flush, of course, there, there are consequences for it, just like there are for any, any policy, okay? We are 62 now. I think more people are still joining. Then for school finance, you can have anti-bribery policy. You know, some parents might want to bring, um, to bring money to, to, um, to, to maybe um, affect the, the admission of their children, to influence the admission of their children into the school. So no child, no parent, no staff is allowed to collect bribe for any reason, either for costs to inflate marks for children or to give, give offer admission to any child in the school. Then you also have death recovery policy. In the death recovery policy, what are the steps taken? When do we now say we are recovering? When do we write it off as bad debt? You have procurement policy where you decide how things are bought, how do you order for things, what are the steps involved, when do we say we need to order, at what point do we order, is it when we have 30% percent, um, percent of the item remaining, who is in charge, how do you go through, who approves, all of this must be clearly stated and it's very important because it helps to save costs in the school when there are clear procurement policies. Handling school cash policy, but in 2022, I do not expect to see schools that are still handling cash. Maybe telling people, bring money for uniforms and they collect cash. Every school by now, at least if their, their size is fine, should have a POS and should have um, um, apps where people can actually pay for their fees directly instead of having the staff handle cash. So you don't say, okay, the admin officer should handle cash for uniforms. Um, like our accountant should handle um, cash for school fees. The bosser should handle cash, uh, maybe for excursions and school trips. No, no, no. So every school should have a, a, a no cash handling policy. Budgeting and financial planning policy, you should also have this. Someone says, can we get the slides? No, you will not get the slides. I don't share my slides when I do 
um, free presentations, but I'm going to upload this on my YouTube channel so you can watch the replay and get all the details that you need. So budgeting and financial planning policy, you should also have that, okay? So for example, in my, uh, on my last job, we had our policies for budgeting and finances. So for budgeting, the policy was that all the heads of schools will prepare budgets. The head of primary will prepare budgets for the primary. The head of um, um, secondary will do that. The head of early years will do that. And then they all bring it to the school administrator. And that was me. Then I'll now go through it with the school accountants and then go on through before we now send to the board for approval. So you must have sort. And then the timing when this is done, that should be maybe a month to the end of the school year or two months before the end of the school year. You've already started projecting for the next school year and um, getting your budgeting together. So you must have financial planning and budgeting policy that covers who does the budgeting, when it is done, the process for it, the items that you expect to be on the budget every year, and if they're introducing any new items, the procedure for even doing that. Then school refund policy. Some schools have a no refund policy. Once fees are paid, they are not refundable. Okay, they'll rather tell you um, to find another item or something or wait for the next term to use that amount. So for some schools, they have a refund policy. So long it is done, uh, between the, the application for the refund is done within maybe um, two days or three after payment, you know? So the, for finance, you might also have a policy for, for um, child re, for fees rebate. So you, your policy could state that if you have, let's say from a family, if you have three children from a family, then there's a percentage on the fee or uh, there's a discount on the fee of the fee on the last child. So you might want to give discount, you might want to give um, rebate, sibling rebate. So you could say the first child pay has maybe 5% of the fee, the second one, uh, maybe um, 2%, the third one, 1%, it all depends. So it all, you know, that would all depend on you. So you should have policies, even sibling rebate, um, discounts that you give, okay, and things like that. If, if someone is paying for a whole school year, what is your policy? Do you give the person maybe a 3% discount on the entire fee just to encourage them to pay for the whole school year? So those are things you need to consider in your finance policy. Then you have parent school policy. Because parents are involved, there must also be finance. Um, oh, okay. Uh, someone says, good evening, Ma, for your fantastic program. I shared the link in the private school union platform across for more participation. We we'll really like to engage you after the program. Oh, okay, I'll take note of that email. I'll take note of it. Okay, so, so for parents, you can have parent school policy, but you must have various policies that guide how parents do. You hear schools complaining that parents just come, they behave anyhow. How would they not behave anyhow? They just come and admit their child, they're happy to collect their money. Then you don't tell them what you do not accept and what is expected of them in your school. Every parent must have a parent handbook, student parent handbook that actually tells them what is expected of their child, what is expected from them as parents. So you must have parent teacher association policy. There are some schools, the parent teacher association wants to take over the whole school. The ex school will not want to go back down after two years. They want to stay there forever and do even seven years as the ex school. Even when their children have graduated from the school, they want to still be there and in the ex school because they know what they're enjoying and what they are doing there. So you must have parent teacher association policy that states, for example, that you change exco every year or every two years. And please do not allow parent exco and PTA exco to go more than two years. If not, you will not be able to handle them after that. They become an authority on an entity on their own. That becomes very difficult for the school to handle. So parent teacher association policy, you must state clearly how you operate your parent teacher association. Is it compulsory for every parent? What is their commitment? Do they pay dues? And um, from the dues, is that where refreshment is paid? What is the money they pay? What is it used for? 
what percentage of them of the, of the PPA um, is from staff? What percentage is from parents? And then how long does the expo stay? What is the role of the expo? What are the various positions in the expo? All this must be clearly stated as guidelines. Traffic management policy. You see some schools do not even tell parents where to park. You must actually tell them where to park and where they cannot get their cars into in your school. So people are talking, please mute them, mute them, mute them. My co-host should mute all of them, please. Management policy. In the morning when they are dropping their kids, how do we manage the traffic? When they pass, do they drop their children in front of the school and then the teachers take them in or are they allowed to come in to hand over the children? All this must be clearly stated. Please do not leave such things to gray areas because one day that's how they will leave their child outside the gate and somebody will pick a child. They will now tell you that they dropped the child in the school. Any child left outside the gate is not actually in the school. So you must have clear policies about traffic management, even pick up and drop off of children. They have to drop off in the morning. What your policy is, when they drop them, do they hand them over directly to a teacher? Or do the teacher stay outside the gate to receive them? All of this must be clearly, clearly stated. The parental involvement policy. How do you want parents to be involved? To what extent? Can they come in and visit the school during school hours? So parents will say, I want to come and see how my child is being taught inside the classroom. They want to come and sit there and, and check. Do you allow such things? Or do you um, bring, bring them, do they have to write to you and, uh, and tell you the date they are coming? Or can they just bump into the school and say, look, I want, I'm not satisfied with my child's teacher. I want to come in there and see what they are doing in that, in that class. Parents visiting the school, even the boarding house, what are the visiting days? You must have policies. Some schools have the policy that if it's a boarding house, parents can come in once every month. In other words, in a whole term, they have three visiting days. Other days, they'll tell you, sorry, the gate is not open to parents to come and visit. So if the parents want to come in and visit or there's an emergency and they want to come and take the child, they must come in and they must apply to take their child out of the school. Okay, so parents visiting the school, whether day school, whether uh, boarding, what are your policies? What is the pickup policy? After school, some parents leave their children there and teachers will be grumbling because the, they cannot close on time. See the policies that you must, children must be supervised all the time. That means you cannot leave. So what is your policy for pickup? When do we cut it off and say from now on, this is the only time between, if school closes at 2.30, and you do not pick your child up by three, then you have to be paying a fine. We have to fine you because we need to release our teachers to close on time, also to prepare for the next day, to prepare their lesson plans, to do other things. And if they just sit there supervising children up and down who have not been picked up, then there's a problem. So you must state your picking up students' policy, drop off students' policy. Do we build them? If a child stays up to five and is not picked, if you have a boarding house, maybe your policy is that you take such a child to the boarding house. I've worked in a school where if no child was picked up by 35, I would just prepare a sleep to build the parents for the child's feeding and overnight stay in the boarding house. Okay? So when they know that they'll be built and that there are policies that are followed, then you now make it known to them so that they comply, okay? So that they don't keep dumping their children. Because no matter how much you tell them, if there are no policies to guide all these things, then there'll be a problem. Then the students also should have policies that guide their behavior, their conduct and everything. So you should have attendance and transparency policy. Attendance is very important in a school. So if a child doesn't come to school, what do you do? You must find out why such a child is not in school. So it could be your policy, that reports are made when a child is not in school. That could also serve for customer service because if the child, if the parents know that you notice when their child is not in school, they'll be really flattered to know that as big as your school is, you notice when their child is not in school. Trouty policies, what if a child is in school but does not attend class and wants to go to hide in the toilet? What are the consequences? Library policy. Some schools have libraries and students are allowed to borrow books. You must have policies. How many books can a child borrow? How often is a child allowed to borrow another book even while he still has another book he has not returned? 
If the book gets lost, what is the pay penalty? Do they have to pay? What if it's a hardcover book? What if it, what if it is a paperback? What if the book is torn? What do you do? So you must be able to get all of these things properly documented. You must have library policies. Okay, you must have code of conduct. Sorry, this is conduct, not conduct. You must have code of conduct for the pupils and the students. You must have child employment and children in entertainment policy. If there's a lot of children are involved with um, different things. I'm sure you've heard about Richard Emanuela, who is a, who is a comedian. That's a school age child. So such a school might have policies that the child must have a certain number of attendance, days of attendance in school. So even if they have um, shooting to do or whatever, they'll say, please do them in the evening. He, well, for attendance, this is our attendance and the child must be in school. So if a child is employed somewhere, for example, let's say in a secondary school, the child is employed or is, um, is working somewhere, what are the policies? The child must be in school. So you must state that if a child is in entertainment, all the children they use for movies and they shoot movies up and down, they take them here. What does your school have to say about it? Do you allow that? Or do you have makeup classes for the, for the children where the parents have to pay extra because it's not your fault that uh, they are taking the children away? So all of this must be clearly stated. Then integrating students into new school policy. When a child, a new child joins your school, what do you do? What are the steps you take? What is the policy for helping them to settle in? And I would say that it is nice that you have a settling in policy that makes you to also write out, um, write the, um, to write the um, a settling in report on the child after two weeks. It's something I share to a lot of the schools I consult for that it differentiates you from other schools. So your settling in policy should be such that you have to, uh, maybe it's a policy in your school that was a child had stayed here for two weeks as a new student, you send in a report that actually um, that tells everything about the child and what they've done, what you have noticed, what they are not doing well or whatever. Now, somebody has written on this slide. Please, can you stop that? The internet is a bit unstable. Someone was trying to call. Let me just shut this down. Okay, so child employment and children in entertainment, I've said that integration into new school. I've talked about the settling in report. Then school uniform report. Some schools have different uniforms for different days. Sorry, the internet was a bit slow. It has just come on now. I hope you can hear me. Can you hear me? Yes, you... we can hear you. Yes, we can hear you. I just want to be sure, okay. I want to be sure. Okay, someone says yes, 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 okay. Okay, thank you. All right, so we're going on. We are 66 now, we're growing. So school uniform policy, what kind of uniform do you have? If your, does your school allow students to make their uniforms from outside or must they buy in school? Some schools, let me have a drink of water. All right. So some schools have a policy that says you cannot make your uniform outside. You must have it made here. And so they have a mark they make. They even check the children's uniforms. If it was not made by the school, they disallow it completely and make them buy. And some allow that, that you can make from outside. They give you a range of vendors you can go to. And some also have a uniform for Monday, for Tuesday, for Wednesday, for Friday, you know, all through the week. I've worked in a school where children had a, a Monday uniform, Tuesday uniform, Wednesday uniform, Thursday uniform, Friday uniform, you know, and all of that. Then of course, sick child policy, which came up in health, Remember, we're talking about students now. When a child has communicable disease, what do you do? What do we do with the child? How do we handle them? Okay. And um, when you are then young carers policy, there are some children who care, maybe they are in year five or year six, and they care for their younger ones who are in the, I mean, the nursery classes. So all of these, you must know, does your school allow um, children to take care 
um, uh, of the other ones, maybe to walk to the school, even walking to a school policy, because your school allowed with all this kidnapping, everything going on, you might want to say that your school does not permit children to walk to school. Because if they kidnap a child just outside your gate, they might come and make noise about it in your school that the child was kidnapped in your school. So you might want to have your young carers policy, a walking to school policy, all of those. So if a young carers, let me give you an example. On my last job, there was a child who was in JSS3. The parents traveled and gave her their car to drive the younger one to school. And this girl was just, um, how old? I don't think she was more than 13 years old. And then we got to school and saw a car parked in the car park, you know, outside of where teachers park. And then a, a report came to me that this child drove both herself and the younger one to school. So I didn't have a young carer's policy because I did, I had made that never happened. But I had to quickly draft something and I invited the parents in. I made them to sign an undertaking that they will never leave these children unattended to or give the younger one and um, the older one who was 13 to drive them to school. Because how can you leave a child of 13 to drive a car to school? But it happened. Are you getting me? So sometimes situations happen in your school that make you come up with a policy to address it. I did I have in all the schools I've worked, I never had to care about young carers' policy because it never happened in any school. But here was I faced with a situation. In fact, I had to seize the car key from the child. And I said I was checking the two of them into the boarding house because they were not driving back home. And I invited the parents. They came in much later. And then I had to explain to them. So right there, I had to come up with a policy that no child was allowed to drive to school. Because ideally, all of them are, were between three months to how old? Maybe 17, right? And none of them was supposed to be an adult. So I didn't think it was proper to have any child take on a car to come and drive to school. What if anything happens? You know? And why would any parent even do that? So for such a thing, you might want to bring in young carers policy um, to address that immediately, okay? Then you could have uh, your curriculum policies that address special needs. You have a policy that, um, uh, for special needs, you admit special education needs and disabilities children into your school. What are the policies for taking care of them? How do you handle that? Then teaching hours policy. What is the, what is the, um, so people are talking. Please mute everybody, my co-host. We are 65, some people have left, uh-oh. Or maybe their network is um, not cooperating. Okay, so teaching us policy, what is the maximum number of hours that teacher or period teachers must have in this school? All of those should be policies. What is the minimum? I'm writing policy. Some schools have a policy that once a child gets to year four, they start writing cursive. I know a few schools that have that policy. They switch to cursive once they get to year three or four. Homework policy. This is very important, actually. If you do not have homework policy in a school, you will see that every teacher will just be dumping homework on the children anyhow. And the parents will be so overwhelmed. And sometimes if you look at all these parents, uh, all these uh, educators forums on uh, social media or fora on social media, you will hear where parents are complaining that I don't want to kill my child. They have uh, seven pieces of homework. The art teacher gave homework. The French teacher gave homework. This one gave homework. How I handle that usually as a school administrator is I've, I've, I have homework policy. If for a child in early years, this is the maximum you can give. And this is the, uh, no homework must exceed this number of minutes for a child in the nursery, okay? And they must have time to bond with their parents and play. For primary, no homework should be more than this number of minutes. For secondary, no homework should be, you know, you should, you should not go burden them with seven pieces of homework in one day. They've been in school from morning till close of work. What time will they have to do all that and turn in the next day? And then every teacher will want to do homework and at the end of the day, now get angry that they didn't do them. So how you handle that as a school head or school administrator is that you come up with homework policy, you draw a timetable. On Monday, all the arts people give homework, for example. Homework from the arts, maybe, um, and then languages, 
uh, maybe I don't know, so you have homework in French, in German, in Yoruba, whatever. Tuesday, maybe um, sciences, okay, or whatever, you know. So you do it in a way that the children will be able to cope with the volume of homework. And the teachers do not keep getting upset that no homework was done. There has to be proper coordination so that homework policy is implemented across all the classes. And what works in the early years will not work in primary and will not work in the secondary, taking into consideration their age and level of assimilation, their um, attention span, and what they should be exposed to. And considering also that in the early years, they need um, uh, direct supervision from their parents to get those well, the, the work done. So indirectly, you're giving the work to their parents to do, okay, when it's too much. Assessment policy, when do you assess? How often, how is it reported? When do you promote a child to the next class? When do you retain a child? What's your retain, um, what, what do you do before you retain a child? Teaching and learning policy. What are your teaching and learning policies? Okay. And for some schools, they must say there must be hands-on activity in every class for every lesson. So that will also reflect in the kind of lesson plan that you have and a whole lot of things. Outdoor education policy. You might have a policy that all the children in early years must go out, must have outdoor every day, every single day and for a certain period. Reading policy. I remember in the last school I brought in in Abuja before I left, we had a very strict reading policy. Uh, where the children had ex we had expectations for every class for reading. And at the end of the school year, we had to grade them on their reading and bring in people to grade them based on international standards and expectations. And then we'll write reports on this. So we had reading policy. So you have your general school policy, setting in policy, uh, people behavior and discipline policy, school readiness policy. When you admit children into year one, when you are made into kindergarten, all of these, you must have policies about all of these things. School sporting and events policy, sex and relationship policy, uh, what happens when um, two staff members are dating, how the, does the school get involved, do they allow them? All of these are things that you must sort out. Assembly policy, what is your policy for assembly? For some schools, they might say, um, um, all this, everybody meets on Monday, and then Tuesday, they have class assemblies instead of whole school assembly. Whole school assembly might be Monday and Friday. And then even during the assembly, what are the policies? Uh, do we focus on developing the children's public, uh, public skills and leadership? Are the assemblies led by the... Which whoever is making that sound? Are the assemblies led by the children? Are they led by the... Wow, we have done one hour, so I need to be fast. Okay, are the assemblies led by the children or are they led by the staff? Attendance policy, I spent time down that already. Student behavior policy, um, attendance policy, respect policy, student discipline policy and procedures, code of conduct for students. Okay, so that's, we've mentioned some of the policies. What we're basically saying is that you should have policies for every aspect of your school, but don't do it in such an overwhelming way that it now sounds like everybody's boxing by laws and they cannot even strike their legs or have fun in the school. We are going to now look at how policies are created in a school, okay? And who is responsible for creating policies in a school? Now, policies are created through two ways, okay? The first is preventive measure, when the business creates a set of policies for how it intends to operate and introduces this to everyone who joins the organization. So this one is preventive. For example, in Pencil Speed Consulting now, I've already created policies for my organization. So when people are joining, they have policies to guide them, okay? When you start a school, you start off with policies. You must have policies that will guide how operations will be done and how things will be done. But what happens? You can also create policies to a, as a reactionary response. So for example, that one I created on the child, um, child carer policy, that was reactionary. I had never had that in all the policies in the schools I have done, but this one, a child of 13 drove a car to school, which to me was, wow, what is that? How can you give a child a car to drive? So I had to react as a school administrator to it, 
by creating a policy. So that was a reactionary response from me as a school administrator. So policies are created in response to specific or unique occurrences or happenings in the organization and serve to guide further occurrences. So after that one, any other parent should know that it is wrong to give a child a pet or any student that told a car to drive to the school. It was against our policies. So it helps to guide further action on such an issue. So remember, preventive policies are the ones you create as you're starting the organization. Reactionary response is the one that you react to. Something happens and you create a policy to react to it and to address that issue. And it becomes a policy that guides further action on that issue. And so when anything happens, they say, no, no, no. We now have a policy that guides how we do that, okay? Now to the main thing, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, I would have had more reaction from you, but honestly, we have to. Be, I have to make it snappy so that we don't spend too much time. I promise you that we'll do one and a half hours, and I want to keep to my word. I'm a woman of my word. So, steps to creating policies and procedures. What are the steps involved? You must have a target and a purpose when you're creating policies. So have a, a specific target in mind. Are you creating, is this policy going to affect just teachers, students, parents? And you must know exactly what you are addressing. So step one, look at this. Can you mute everyone? Mute, 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 mute everyone. Who is that? Mute, please. So look at your school's activities responsibilities and the environment. Break each into its simplest form. Describe what should happen, then create the appropriate policy or rules to mitigate the situation, state the consequences. For example, maybe you have noticed in your school that children are always left unsupervised. A child gets injured. Tomorrow, another one breaks his head. Tomorrow, one breaks his arm. That will tell you there's a problem with what? Supervision. So you've identified the need now, need for supervision. Now, who is going to supervise? It is, it's definitely not the gate men who will leave their post to come and supervise the children on the playground, supervise them during lunchtime, supervise them during break, and all of that. Supervise them when they have debates and all of that. So what do you do? What do you want to happen? You want the children to be properly supervised. So you create a policy. In XYZ school, children are always supervised. No activity with students or calls without supervision. So what are the consequences? Then you now state also the procedure. Because for every for most policies, there are procedures. So the procedure would be to have a, a shadow for supervision, for example. So that even when children are not picked up, there's still someone to supervise them. And they don't have teachers on duty who supervise. And then you make sure that everybody's also trained to supervise. Maybe they did not even understand what supervision meant. You've identified the need for supervision. All of them must be trained. Who is going to be trained? Everybody. Who is going to do the supervision? The teachers. What will be the consequences? Henceforth, anybody who is well, anybody who is supposed to um, supervise and is not found at the point of at the place of supervision will face so 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 consequences. It could be a query to start with. I'm drinking water. It could be a query to start with, and to show that this is something serious. The next step might be um, uh, maybe a. a, a it could even be a, maybe a suspension for two days without pay, whatever. But make sure that there are consequences attached and you let them know. So create the appropriate policy or rules to mitigate the situation and state the consequences. Then who is responsible? Remember, we just mentioned a, a case now of supervision. Who is going, who is this policy affecting directly? The teachers. Who is responsible for its implementation? The supervisors. 
So the teacher and the supervisor, because the teacher is implementing directly, is one supervising, and the person who oversees them is maybe the head teacher, head of department, or whoever. So you make sure they are all properly trained to know their role. The head teacher needs to know how to look out for those supervising. Those supervising need to know what to do. Have clearly, um, have clearly defined, sorry, defined roles. If, um, even if one person wears multiple roles, everyone should have clearly defined responsibilities. So the responsibility for the supervision is what? That of the teacher and the person supervising the teacher. Okay, this responsibility should be assigned to a position or job title and not an individual. Now you go on to draft the policy. Use the keys method that keep it short and simple. Keep the language simple. Okay, keep in mind the education level of the persons who will be expected to implement the policy. Keep it short but detailed. So in this case, now we talked about supervision. We can say, Every child in a um, Nancy group of school is supervised at every activity. You can see it's just simple. It's a policy that every child is supervised at every activity. That is clear enough to anybody, any human being at all. And you keep it simple, just simple, very short and detailed. Then when you have written the policy, see where a lot of schools miss it, the school administrator or head of school or school owner will just sit there, write a policy, but we'll stamp it on everybody. You review that policy. When we say review, what it is written, you give others to read it and give you feedback. Because sometimes the words you might use, you will understand it, and you might think that is fine. By the time you now send it out, everybody will wonder, what was the person talking about? Are you saying this? Are you saying that? Are you saying this? Are you getting me? So you get clarity. To get clarity from you on what you mean so that it is clear and not ambiguous. Is it a general policy or related to a specific task? So they will ask questions so that you now know whether there's a need to review that um, the policy at that point, whether there's anything you add to it or to remove it to make sure it's clear to everybody. And you make sure that you target all um, teach teachers must supervise, whatever. You make sure you target whoever it is that is involved. So if you say just supervise, okay, you now know who is involved, and then you now review. How often will this occur? Every day. In other words, it forms part of their job description and is a policy as well, okay? So does the policy stand alone, or is it supported by any other policy? Supervision policy is supported by safeguarding policy because it's actually, it's, it's actually, it's supposed, it's actually supported. So they have to know that. Then create the procedure. So whenever us do this, what do we do? That the head teacher or the head of department, whoever is involved, will have to do spot checks to make sure that supervision is going on. And there'll be teachers on duty There'll be those who supervise playground. You check the playground, have a walk round to be sure. So there must be procedures for making sure that this is done. Then for the teachers, what do we do? Teach them how to supervise. What are the procedures? For example, break time, if they're going out, maybe all the kids line up with their hands behind to make sure that they march in order. So no child is left in the class unsupervised. There's a head count as they're going out. Whatever, every detail involved in making sure that that policy is um, actually implemented is done and procedures are created. So the procedure might even include how they march out of the class. Maybe what led to creating that policy and making it stronger was that some kids were in the class and some were on the playground, which should never be in any school. So you make sure there's a procedure for them to line out of the line up out of the class with their hands behind everybody walking out, finding out, and the head count is taken as they are, that is done. And the same thing when they come back, okay? So when you're, there are some policies you create, all these ones of uh, deducting salary, someone comes late, just do like this. You have to be a bit careful with some of those things uh, because if they are taken off, um, some have legal implications. If you deduct someone's salary till they have only five naira left, I'm sure you know that there's some things that are actually kind of legal. 
So you must be very careful how you go about this. So if you have any doubt on whether your policies have legal implications, consult a lawyer. In all the schools I worked, I actually had lawyers that worked with me. So when we do, when, we, when I develop policies, okay, we actually run them by our lawyers. On my last job, we had a legal department. I had to look at even the handbook and then all the policies I came up with as the administrator. So all of those things have to be checked before um, we now um, we were now implemented. So I advise that you get a copy of the labor law that operates in your country. If you're in Nigeria, you have the Nigerian labor law. And then you might also want to have a lawyer that um, you liaise with uh, for your organization to run some policies by them to tell you the implication in case somebody takes a legal action against you. Okay, so just because you own a school doesn't mean that you can, you can just say from now on, all my teachers come to school on Monday. It is now on, uh, sorry, on Sunday, from morning till close to your evening. I'm the owner and nobody can talk to me. It is my school and that's my own policy. No, your policies must be in line with the labor law because if anybody takes you off, then there'll be a problem. So make sure that you study the labor law, know what it says. And if you're in doubt of anything, consult a lawyer, have a legal person that works with you. So after you have done this, send it to the school board or the stakeholders for approval. Some schools do not have a school board. And so the school owner approves policies directly. So you must be able to, you must be able to do this. You must be able to get approval. When, on my last job, I prepared all the policies from scratch and I had to send them to the school board and to the legal department for them to check before it came back to me. And then we now run, um, we introduced it to all the staff, did a training and did a, more like a, a reinduction of everyone to introduce them to all the policies, okay? So after you have got the approval, the next step is you make sure you have a plan to introduce it to them, explain to them, and train the whole staff on the policies. I, I would advise that all of your policies are in a handbook, but not scattered here and there. Have a handbook, um, an employee handbook for the staff. The policies for parents, you should have a student and parent handbook. It's something I do as a service to organizations. I do that for schools I consult, for I help them to um, create policies or review the ones they have or go through them and you know um, and maybe improve on them. So we have we have the parent and student handbook, and then we also have the employee handbook, which has all of the policies, the you know, and procedures that are expected of them. So once you have the policy, you don't just say from now on, this is what we're going to do, whether you like it or not, and you go away. No, you now have a process for implementing. You let them know why you have created this policy, explain to them, train them on it. Don't assume that they know. And tell them the implication when they do not adhere and what, what, your, what steps you're going to take as consequences if that is not done, okay? That should also include um, if, 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 if it's going to, something that is going to affect parents, you should train them to also know how to address the parents. You know, some policies are introduced in schools where they are teachers. They ask a teacher, what's going on? I don't know. Uh, that's how they come up every day with policies, policies, policies. We don't even know. So for them to, to put you in the right light where parents are concerned, make sure that you actually carry them along and explain to them nicely, train them, and then also train them how to answer parents when parents want to know. Maybe, maybe there's a, maybe it's a policy on fee collection, and you know, and you're going to drive children away. The staff should know why you're doing it. You need the money for their salaries, okay? And, you, and so they have to be involved with it and also cooperate with you. So when they need to explain to parents, they should do it in a professional manner, not say, I don't know, that's our school, that's how they do, that is how they do their thing, this is how they do their thing, you know, those kind of comments. You should be able to carry the staff along so that you're on the same page. So once you have introduced the policy, it becomes effective and let them know the date it becomes effective. So we can say from the 1st of April, this policy comes into being in the organization. And so from then, 
But after the training, you watch how they do on the 1st of April. This is how we start. This is how we do it, okay? Funny but very common in some settings where you see staff not sure about policies in place. Very true, um, Joel Olani, very true. Very, very true. It happens. So, uh, so now what you do as the administrator, head teacher, head of school, after you have implemented, that's not the end goal. You monitor and review and then revise. So monitor the effectiveness and be getting feedback. Then look at instances where the, the staff flout actually go against those, um, those um, policies and find out who was involved, what happened, what led to it, whether you still need further training. And then I advise that you review your policies annually. It's a lot of work. But if you're the one who put the policies in place, that will not be too much work. What happens is this, you should have a journal as a school administrator or head of school, where you jot down incidences about your, about your policies and procedures. If they're not working or if it's still ambiguous, people do not understand, or they're still, they are still, they're still hazy, you should be noting all of these things. So you note them first term, second term, third term, at the end of the school year, you sit down and revise to do what works. And sometimes you might form a committee, a policy committee to look into it and then review with you. And then you have a look at it and say, oh, this worked or this didn't work. And so we need to revise, we need to review. Okay, we are, we are almost rounding up. I said one hour, 30 minutes. This is one hour, 20 minutes now so that we can have a little time. And who is responsible for creating policies? It's normally the school administrator, the head teacher, the head of school, or the principal, or, or the head of, of human resources. Okay, and usually he or she does not work in isolation, but works along either with a committee or, of course, with the school board or the school owner. These are points you should note when you're creating policies. You must be current and up to date, review and revise as necessary. Have a specific audience in mind when you're creating a particular policy. Use very clear and easy to understand language. Ensure policy is informative, direct, and straight to the point of ambiguous. Please mute whoever is making that noise. The policy should not create confusion. You know, there's so I have worked in a school in my early years when I was just starting those early years in my career. I used some policies would just come as if it's fight, you know, from the and the headmaster or head of school then, is as if we are fighting. No, it's not a fight though. It's really not a fight. It's just to make sure that operations move um, properly and that things are done the proper way. So it should not be confusion. The target audience should understand the underlying reason for the policy. <laughs> for example, for supervision, they should know. Mute, 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 mute. They should know why children need to be supervised all the time. They should know about the, what they want for finance. Every policy you put, be open to answering questions from them and that will make it credible. Review your policies yearly and write new ones as needed. Keep documentation of all policies and procedures that need to be added all through the school year and they should go in, in, um, into effect the following year. Do not copy policies and procedures word for word from another school because what works for them might not work for you. But there are some policies every school must have and there are policies that should be peculiar to your school because no two schools are the same, okay? So every school, every school is different. All right, so who is these policies? All of us in a school. It will affect the school owners, board of management, um, also affect support staff, parents, students, everybody. So even cleaners should have policies, okay? For example, um, who maybe the head cleaner is the one who signs for the cleaning materials, distributes to others. You should have guidelines for how everything is done in your organization. So no cleaner will just go to the store, carry everything, or maybe you issue to each cleaner to keep um, periodically, maybe weekly, and you make sure that they utilize all of these things um, properly, okay? The school, very true, the school has, has, an, 
the school head or administrator should keep a journal to assist in reviewing policies at the end of the school year. Thank you, Nancy. This is my take home. Oh, very good. You should do that actually. So that at the end of the school year, you just go through, these were the areas we had problems in. These policies are fine. Yes, these ones are not. And then, you know, you go on. So parents must sign. Now listen, policies must be given to parents at the point when their children are admitted into your school. That is where a lot of schools miss it. You must have the same way you have the employee handbook, which has the policies and procedures. You should also have the parent handbook that guides them on everything about the school. So you don't have a parent coming to fight your teacher uh, instead of knowing who to report to. They must know who to report to if there are issues. They must know what the school policies are. They must know expectations of the school from their children, the code of conduct and everything. They must know policies guarding their the PTA, how parents should conduct themselves in the school. There was a school, even how parents should come to the school. Was that in a school we have worked because was a girl, a lady came into the school in her nighty with her net, came out of the car, and just started talking anyhow. So we had policies even about such things. Parents should come in to the school neatly dressed, unless you're staying in your car and just dropping the children and going. If you're coming out and people are seeing you, you must be properly dressed. You cannot be wearing your nighty or pajamas from home unless we have a pajamas day, you know, to now come to the school. Uh, with your with your net looking somehow no even parents how they conduct themselves in the school because we are raising children and we are also role models to them so that is it so we are all affected by so conclusion school policies and procedures are put together to guide the day-to-day -day functioning of the school as well as to make it safe and efficient for learning to occur now my offers my, the school administrators compile, um, the school administrate, administrators academy is starting in April, the second cohort. It goes for 65,000 Naira, but anybody who is at this webinar can just use the code cohort2, cohort2 webinar attendant. I just tell me cohort2 webinar attendant and I'll know, and then you can have it for 55 if you're paying between now and Saturday, okay? If you're paying between today and Saturday, you, are, you can pay 55,000. Now after that, the price goes back to 65. And then my three books, let me stop. Um, let me just share so that you can see my face. My three books, um, Dear Educator, that's my, that's my book, Dear Educator. The School Administrator's Companion, Effective Boarding House Administration. All three of them, the duration of the course is three months. So it says what's the duration? It's three months actually, it's three months. Okay, so those are the things that, so this goes for 5,000 Naira, this goes for 4,500, but the price is going up to 4,800 on the 1st of April. And this is 3,500. All three of them, 13,000. But if you're paying for it today, tonight, you get the whole three for 11,000 and save yourself 2,000 Naira. So let me just share my slide again. But I don't want to share. No, I don't want to have it this big. Okay, so that you can pay 11,000, you save yourself 2,000 Naira. Then my coaching session is 15,000 per session for an hour. But if you're in this session and you want me to coach you between now and the end of March, um, you can have me for 8,000 Naira an hour and save yourself 7,000 for each hour you spend with me. For the books, okay, how do you get the books? I'm going to share the account details right now. Okay. So that's the Connected School Administrators Academy and it starts, it starts in April. I'm going to share the account details. Um, Nancy Ekwezu, I'm going to put that in the comments. Please check the comments right now. Nancy Ekwezu. 
First bank, 2014532690 is a current account. If you remember, oh, um, thank you so much. Thank you. So that is the account. I'm also going to share it on the WhatsApp platform. Okay, yes, I'll share it there. So do we have questions? I'm going to stop recording now because I promised you we'll do one hour, 30 minutes and it's exactly one hour, 30 minutes. I told you I'm a woman of my word. So he says, thanks a lot for this insightful session. You're welcome, dear teenager Tony, my buddy. <laughs> so please, anybody who is interested in joining the academy, let me know right away. My phone number is 0803-5880367. Olu Falake says, thank you very much for this session. So much work, so much to work on. Honestly, there's a lot to work on. The class is value added, value loaded. So thank you so much. Thank you, mom. It's so impactful. Heart, I heart you big time. Oh, thank you, members. Thanks a lot. Thank you, everybody. Thanks for coming. I'm going to stop recording now so that we can start taking. She says, worth attending, Mrs. Brown. Oh, thank you. I'm so glad. It's always my pleasure to share. <laughs> um, please reach out to me for the books. I deliver nationwide. Delivery to Lagos Island is 1,005. Delivery to mainland is 1,000. And then I'm going to stop sharing right, right now. I'm going to stop recording so that we can take questions.